to dream chasers radio with me your host yaya diamond what's up people how you doing it is a great day and i'm so very excited to be here today man i am telling you one thing we have an amazing author on the show today because this is the author edition thank you guys so much for tuning in and we have mr john Santabrigia on the show today welcome to the show thank you dear thank you thank you so before we get into your books and before i ask my major question because i do have a major question okay and let you know Tell us a little bit about yourself. About me? Yes. Oh. <laughs> well, um, I am a musician. Uh, I love to write books, and I like to write about things that I feel very strongly about, and that's why uh, Women Rising, because I feel that women should be treated equally, and and uh, um, the book, The Day I Almost Destroyed the Boston Symphony, and other stories, is written because I wanted to let people know what goes on behind the scenes and how interesting it can be. And also, I wanted to give uh, some encouragement to people that uh, are have a vision in their life. And I am by the grace of God, I got in the Boston Symphony, one of the most prestigious orchestras in the world, and I mean by, by the grace of God, because I had started the cello not until almost 15, and that's so late. Yo-Yo Ma started when he was three and a half. And when I first went to Yo-Yo's teacher, he said, that, don't try to get in a major orchestra because you started too late. So uh, I want to... Sh show other people that don't give up and because you think that all the statistics are against you believe that you can do it if you have a great dream and a good desire and i just have to thank god that i was able to get in the boston symphony and there were something like 11 people that all did something that made the difference for instance i'm painting a barn in the berkshire mountains and Mrs. Goldberg comes under the ladder and she says, Johnny, do you know there's a last minute audition for the Boston Symphony over at Tanglewood? And this was in 1959. There's no way, there was no internet. We didn't know, we couldn't find anything. If she hadn't told me, I would never have known. That's the number one person. But it goes on and on. For instance, when she was in Vienna, before she left, and got out, uh, she was in a, in a bus and a uh, Nazi came in to the, the, to the bus and uh, actually it was, a, I think, a, a, well, anyway, it, and they said, all Jews stand up and the man next to her held her down and that saved her so that she was able 30, 23 years earlier or later to tell me about this and wow. it just goes on and on and on but anyway i wanted to tell um the the stories behind the scenes too and and have people realize that there's so much fun in classical music and i can i tell you a funny story yes definitely all right i'm at home I'm now first cello in the St. Louis Symphony, and then we have a run out in Rolla, Missouri, where it's away from St. Louis, and they have to take everybody in a bus to get there. And the management calls me up and says, John, do you want to go in a car with the conductor and with the three other guys? You won't have to go in the bus with everybody else. I said, sure. So they pick me up. We go to the concert. We're playing it. And the conductor gets very excited at the end of the program and his baton goes up through his wig and lifts it off his head and comes down on the side of his face and he can't get it on straight. And the flutes move their music stands up because they're laughing. They can't, and it never gets it on. I go back to the stage and everybody's howling. But when they find out I've got to go in a car with the conductor, oh my goodness. So I come out of the stage door with my cello and there are the four guys around the car. And I come down, his wig is on perfect. 
We get in, we put our seat belts on, and the associate concert master says, my, that really was a hair-raising performance. <laughs> anyway, there are so many funny stories. And uh, people ask, you know, how did you almost destroy the Boston Symphony? Yes, what please tell me. you destroy an orchestra? Well, if you do something so foolish that the conductor has to stop in the middle of the concert, then you destroy it. Well, in the case with the Boston Symphony, it was almost because um, I was with two violins walking off stage, playing in Harold in Italy, and we had its solos, and the conductor was going to conduct us as the door opens, and he conducted us, but the two violins weren't together. So he got real mad, and he gave a downbeat, one beat soon, and so I jumped with him. Well, the orchestra disintegrated on the stage. It was chaos. And the, nobody got together until the very end, there were trumpet sound went da 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 da. Everybody knew where that was and they came together. And so I was able to not, uh, I went home and told my wife, pack your bags, I'm sure I'm going to get fired. The next day, I come backstage and there is the conductor. Oh, I'm walking up to him, I'm very embarrassed. And when I get next to him, he bursts out laughing because he knew he was partly at fault. But when we played in Carnegie Hall, he said, just stay with me, you idiot. <laughs> anyway, that's how I almost destroyed the Boston Symphony. Oh, Any other questions? Oh, my God, oh, well, yes. Oh my okay. goodness, okay, so the Boston, okay, so how long did you tour with them? And what was it like besides that? What was it like for you mentally? Well, um, I stayed with the Boston Symphony for only nine years because I then went to the St. Louis Symphony to be the principal cello, the first cello. And I did that for 37 years. But it was wonderful to be in the orchestra and both orchestras. And then when my first rehearsal was with, um, in the, with the Boston Symphony was with the Boston Pops and Arthur Fiedler was conducting. And the orchestra was treating him terribly. And I just got into the orchestra. And I, I asked one of the three women, that's all that were there at that time. I said, what's going on? And she said, well, I spoke to the orchestra last year. And the, I told them this was no way to treat famous Arthur Fiedler. And the next rehearsal, the orchestra didn't make fun of him, didn't do anything like that. And... He thought they were giving him the cold shoulder treatment. So he had a mild heart attack. And so that's why she said, we never treat him well anymore. We want him to know that we we like him in spite of the fact that we're making fun of him. <laughs> anyway. Oh, oh, man. Oh, my gosh. That must have been scary. My goodness, my goodness. So and, and all of these experiences are in the book? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are more, more are in. It goes on and on and on. But I also tell uh, stories about all the famous people like Yo-Yo Ma. Uh, he used to come over to me and ask me before he played his concerto because he's the most famous cellist in the world. And when he come over, he'd say, how's Sarah? That's my daughter, who is also one of the best cellists in the world. And she and uh, he was always kind to me. He was a wonderful guy. And uh, it was there were so many wonderful famous musicians that I had the the glory and the, the I'm so grateful that I got to play with them and uh, be with them and that was just and I tell these stories about them behind the scenes of what what these wonderful conductors were like and uh, so and that was fun for me and uh, anyway any any other questions <laughs> definitely are you kidding me. And that is the second the title of your second right. book. Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Definitely. So tell us about that book. Okay. Uh, Are You Kidding was inspired by the fact that someone very close to me was an atheist. And I happen to believe in God very strongly. And I didn't want to lecture this person. Uh, so I thought I'd write a book and bring out different things that would... Uh, be interest rather than to lecture. And uh, in this book, uh, it takes place in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, where I live half the year. And <clears throat> in, it's a beautiful, wonderful town. And two um, 
scientists move next to each other and they knock on the door, one of them, and says, hey, I just moved in. But are you kidding? No, no. Yes, I just moved in. Are you kidding? Anyway, they start that way. And uh, they eventually, they do a lot of things together. They like to do it. And uh, they get to know each other. And then they met, meet two fraternal twin uh, women who are really very nice. And it turns out in the book that one of the scientists and one of the women, twins, doesn't believe in God. And so they have wonderful times together, but they also have very friendly and loving arguments. And like uh, uh, Sally says, Chad, if the sun was further away, we'd freeze to death. If it was closer, we'd burn up. Oh no, Chad says, that's just coincidence. So his God at first is coincidence. And so they have all these wonderful arguments, but the experiences that they have are actually the experiences that I had. And I thank God for having survived and come out of them. And for instance, once I drove, I couldn't stop because I was going too fast at night through a whole troop of deer and antelope. Uh, I'm not sure which, which they were, but just as I reached them, they parted and I went right through and didn't touch one. And I, I thanked God for this. But anyway, this happens in the book to them and all kinds of different things like that. And um, what, what's happening is that the sci one of the scientists is um, having a problem because he is standing up and fighting for a company that uh, that is trying to get um, uh, the truth out about certain facts, but there is a man who doesn't want this from the one of the law firms who is hawking them, and that is so. That's their suspense in the story. You just don't know whether this they're going to those four wonderful people are mm -hmm. going to be killed by this man. And that comes out in the story. But anyway, it uh, what all the stories are true except the very last story. And that there, I tell the documentation for what that is true. And so um, it's it, it's really about God. And, and I use humor and suspense to get the message out that God is wonderful and he's mm -hmm. with us. Anyway, any other questions? Yeah, you know, that's so interesting how you did that and how, you know, you kind of twisted it and made it so, so that people would, you know, see that this is just not a coincidence. I mean, yeah. are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> are you kidding? Yeah. Are you kidding? This is not, no. Are you kidding? This just can't know. be. What this is, is this? Not, it can't not be. a coincidence. Mm -mm. No. No, no, definitely. I understand that. Are you kidding? My yeah. gosh, my gosh. So what is your writing process? How do you go about doing these things? Because, you know, one is completely about you uh, from what I gather. And the other one is completely about you, but in a third person kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I, as I said, I, I feel very strongly about certain issues. I have to say that I'm a feminist. Uh, that's why I wrote that book. And um, I have stories, uh, so many true stories about how women have been badly treated. And my daughter, who is uh, this great cellist and tours all over the world, she's had conductors um, make uh, movements and advances that they shouldn't do. And it has always imposed upon her. That's only one incident. There are so many others which I cannot talk about. But that I wanted to address this and I wanted us, all of us to treat each other equally, men and women, green yeah. or yellow, all that don't, don't, we're all God's children and we should not uh, decide that one should be treated better than the other. You're right. And so, and that's why I wrote that book. Um, and I, as I told you, the reason I wrote the, the um, uh, are you kidding? And then it, the, the day I almost destroyed the Boston Symphony uh, was so much inspired by how 
glorious. I felt it was like to be in classical music in a, a major orchestra and how exciting it was every day for me to go and be with a hundred men and women and we could talk and we could do all kinds of things. I used to do funny things even in the orchestra. Sometimes I'd have about 20 measures of rest where I'd have to wait and the orchestra's playing and I would see the violas over there and I would take, I would go with my ear and move them and, and, and they would laugh because not everybody can move their ears like that. <laughs> anyway, we used to do funny things, but at the same time, we played the glorious spiritual music that we loved. And it was, and it, you know, we just didn't, people always ask me, what's your favorite composer? They're all so wonderful. It's hard for me. I like Bach. Oh, yes. And I like uh, Chopin. I like Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky, you know, people don't realize this, but it's come out in the last major books. Uh, Tchaikovsky was forced to kill himself. And people thought that he died of a, 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 a disease that was going on. But it's been proven that he actually was, uh, there were six high school friends who knew he was having a, an affair with a man in the royalty. And so they made him take arsenic over days. Can you imagine the agony? And Tchaikovsky, what a composer he is. I love him. Oh, he's wonderful. Anyway, um, so it, it's just so many exciting things. And when you think about what Beethoven went through, he, at age of a little after 20, he started to go deaf. And he wrote all this music. And a friend of mine uh, wrote a wonderful book called uh, um, the, 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 Lo the Love Story of, of Beethoven. Anyway, he, he had um, uh, not one successful love affair in his life, never got married, almost killed himself. But he just wanted so much to write that music. And so he went and um, uh, refused to kill himself and wrote the music and kept going and going and going and writing and it never and always dealing with unhappiness. But if you listen to his music, there's so much joy and so much of it. And some there's sadness, but some is joy. And it's just incredible. Anyway, and, and also another interesting thing about classical music, when you stop to think that it's written with the 12 tone system, C, C sharp, D, E, F, and, it, and this didn't really start to come out in the world until around the 1300s. But then by 1600s, then Bach, and they, they started to write in this system. Just think we wouldn't have Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, uh, Stravinsky, Shostakovich, we wouldn't have any of these people if it wasn't for the fact that that the twelve tone system was created, and who created that? I feel God did. All right, and then oh, I was going to tell you. Oh no, I was going to tell you another story. What's so interesting is when I lived a life in these different orchestras, I got to experience things that were just sometimes amazing. And during the Cold War, the Shostakovich and the Russian composers were invited to come to America and play with their orchestra. But the Russians, because Stalin, he would, Stalin had passed, but the Russians would not let Shostakovich come because Stalin hated him. And so the country still, the, the, well, the administration still was against Shostakovich. We, the Boston Symphony said, unless you, Shostakovich can come, you can't come. So they let him come, but they wouldn't let us play his music. And I was in the orchestra. Uh, I had just gotten in and I, I could look up on the stage and there was Shostakovich way over in the side and all the other, Kapolevsky, Rockman, all these other wonderful composers were at the other end. They wouldn't associate with him. Well, after the concert, we went to the 
lounge and we had food and it was really nice. And the associate concert master got up and said, I want to make a tribute to the greatest composer of the 20th century, Dmitry Shostakovich. And all the other Russian composers looked down at him like, and Shostakovich got up and bent over and looked like he was very scared. And he bowed and went back. And it was such an experience for me to witness how someone was ostracized within a country because the leadership said to do it. And we can look at life now. And so often when a country does something crazy, it's not the people. It's often the leadership. Yeah. And yeah. But when that's why we have to be grateful when we have loving, understanding leaders in our nations. Yeah, definitely. Wow. wow. John, thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate it. You know, knowing that you're a feminist, though, I mean, how did that come about really quick? I mean, being a feminist and a male, how, how does that work for you? Well, as I said, I, my two daughters, I have a son and two daughters, and they are, my two daughters are both musicians, wonderful musicians. One teaches at University of Nevada, and she was a concertmaster in different orchestras. And, um, and then uh, my wonderful daughter, Sarah, San Ambrosio, and I saw how they were treated. Also, my life was made wonderful by women. If that woman hadn't told me about the Boston Symphony, that would not happen. My mother always supported me. You know, and she was a wonderful pianist. And I was just learning things and she supported. I So many times, wonderful women have done so much for me that I just feel very close and very grateful to women. And when I saw or see women treated unfairly, that upsets me. And so I thought, I'll write a book about it, but yeah. not lecture them, but tell stories and try to get them involved in what's going on anyway. Yes, definitely. We have three books and yes. you get it all on your website. Am I correct? Yes. And where would that be? Uh, it's www. John Sant, that's J O H N S A N T, no capitalization, capitals, J O H N S A N T, at dot com. I mean, dot at com, not at dot at com. No. Just <laughs> dot com. It's <laughs> dot com. Gotcha. John Sant dot com. W W W John Sant dot com. All right. Uh, <laughs> you can see that I can be somewhat of a fool at times. <laughs> That's okay. We all are. We all yes, are. we are. We yes, all we are. are <laughs> well, John, yeah. thank you so much for being on the show. I truly appreciate it. I appreciate what you've done. And all three books are different, but all three books come from your heart, which is very important. Thank you yes, so much. They do. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you guys so much for tuning in. Don't forget to dare to be different. We're going to have all of that information in the description box below. So it'll be easy for you guys to go ahead and get those books for yourself. I mean, you know, having the, the almost the tenacity to destroy the Boston Symphony. I mean, I want to know more about that one. I'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye. -bye. I didn't think be different. I didn't think be different. I didn't think be different.